Uh, first, I want to I want to thank you for uh, for having me. Um, a little bit different of a talk uh, here. We're going to be focusing on. I, I think Stephen Wheat talked about it with his squirrels at the beginning. The you know missing middle. I'm not going to hopefully use that word, but it's. Uh, I am going to be talking about. Um, the broad need within manufacturing. I mean, this is true globally. Most of my stuff's going to be focusing on uh, North American statistics, but it's it's uh, it's a huge opportunity. It's a huge challenge, uh, you know, that these companies are facing. But before I get into that, let's see if I got the right button. Um, I'm not sure how many of you even know who NCMS is. NCMS is the National Center for Manufacturing Sciences. We've been around uh, for closing in on 30 years, 27, and uh, we're a U.S.-based organization that sole purpose is to help manufacturers be globally competitive. And so one of our huge efforts is what you're talking about here today. How do we help companies of all sizes, anything from GE and Boeing and Lockheed down to small mom and pop shops, be more effective in their day-to-day -day operations? And one of the huge gaps, Addison talked very well about it a little while ago, is that you know, most of these companies have zero of the tools that you guys are talking about here today. And so how do we try to bridge that gap? Where do we start? How do we fill it in? How do we address that? Uh, and then how do we move it forward so that all companies can be globally competitive? So that's a big initiative within NCMS. Uh, we do this collaboratively, so many of you in here are actually members of NCMS. Uh, and we have a lot of others across the country uh, that have been partnering with us in this effort. So, you know, we talk about, you, know, you see some of the stuff like uh, uh, what Wolfgang just said, that's an enormous collaboration going on in Europe. Um, everything NCMS does is collaborative. So we basically, we're not, we're not here to replicate any of your activities. We're here to work with you to partner and create uh, some consolidation of those activities into a collaborative effort to address these needs. And so we do this in a wide variety of things. We've worked on everything from things to help make pampers faster to, you know, making e-coat, you know, for aircraft carrier decks to, I mean, you name it. It's just, there's a whole smattering of things that NCMS works on. Uh, but, you know, my, my responsibility is what we're talking about here today and how do we get that to U.S. Manufacturers. So, you know, these are kind of uh, some obvious reasons why you collaborate. I'm not going to belabor that, but it is it is what NCMS does. <coughs> so, I want to spend a few minutes this morning, kind of dropping five truth bombs on you as far as the manufacturing space in particular. So, I'm going to kind of take the discussion and the question that was going on between Addison and Stephen Wheat at the beginning and kind of expound on that a little bit and kind of drill in a little on the manufacturing side and why the supply chain matters, uh, why this whole topic is so critical. And uh, you're going to hear some of the same words that have been talk talked about here, especially complexity, you know, time to market, uh, you know, speed and efficiency within, um, you know, organizations, all of those things matter. And as we kind of go forward, you're going to see that uh, what we are talking about, what we call it big data or just data management or, or whatever, is, uh, is really at the heart of it. It is the, it is the essence of the problem. So I gave some information to our marketing guy. And so some of these dates might not be exactly wrong, I mean, exactly right, but uh, I, I think I, I want you to get the gist of, of, of what we're trying to say here. If you look at complexity versus time in manufacturing, uh, you see really two different things. You see, as time has gone on, products have become more and more complex. You go from you know, parts to subsystems to uh, whole platforms, and the complexity of those platforms have been more and more, um, you know, high end. And in some industries, they've been able to keep the product development cycle, the time to market, how fast from concept to getting something on a, on you know, out to the consumer, has been fairly flat. The automotive, automotive industry has stayed roughly somewhere around 30 months to get a car from concept to you know, the, where you can go out and buy it. That really hasn't changed. Their goal is 24 months, they'd like to get less, but they've typically been about 30 months and that's always been the case. It has not changed much in, in 50 years. Uh, electronics kind of fall in that same space. They just, they keep coming out on a regular basis and, uh, and the time to market has actually shrunk in some cases. But in aerospace and defense, it's been absolutely the opposite. You see the complexity growing and growing, but the time to market is just swelling. And if you're in the, you know, I, I think John West, you could probably agree with this. You look at a new platform, you know, the one, you know, the F-35 came out, the complexity of that, the number of suppliers, uh, but it's, they're just, they're not able 
to bring that to market in a way anywhere close to what other sectors have. And so it's not just a manufacturing thing, it's a sector thing uh, within manufacturing. And you can kind of see how some of these things just kind of line up. So if you look at some of these types of um, products, you can kind of see just the, we start talking about, well, you know, where's the data coming from? You know, and all of these things are complex, whether it's a chip or the F-35, they're, they're complex. And uh, they have their own complexities, they have their own information, they have their own data, and a lot of that is not just developed at the OEMs. So it's not just Intel, it's not just Lockheed, it's not just Ford Motor Company. Uh, they have a massive supply chain that is underneath girding this whole process. And when Stephen talked about the missing middle, you know, that's, that pretty much is the supply chain. And, and I, I, I will echo for a second what Addison said, and, and I think John West said it about the DOD. Um, I've heard Caterpillar say the same thing. You know, they would say, within our organization, we have our own missing middles. So, you know, you could look at two different degrees of missing middle. You know, one is the supply chain, small companies, medium-sized companies. But the other one is usage within larger companies that just, just kind of falls off the map. And so I'm more focused on the former than the latter today, but they do both exist. So when you look at supply chain, you know, some of the numbers, and this is a survey we actually did with Addison what, two, almost two and a half years ago, now almost three years ago, um, but the numbers are holding true. You know, if you look at small and medium-sized manufacturers, and you can pick your number, whether it's, a, you know, it's 100 or 500, we've traditionally gone with 500, that's the National Association of Manufacturers, use NAM. Uh, so you have 500 or fewer employees. In the United States, there's 300,000 of those companies. You know, 12 million jobs. You do the math, each man, those, those 300,000 manufacturers average 40 employees each. Worldwide, there's 2 million of those companies. But in the U.S., there's 300,000. They represent 12 million jobs in the U.S. That's, that's two-thirds of the U.S. manufacturing force. Uh, and they represent three-quarters of the R&D done in this country. And so, you know, that, that's the point that people miss, is that three-fourths of the R&D innovation done in the United States in manufacturing is done by companies under 500 people. You know, we, we think of Lockheed, we think of GE, we think of Intel, we think of, you know, all these different companies are doing innovation. That's only, you know, it's less than 30% of what's happening in the United States. And yet, these small companies doing all that innovation do not have these tools. And a lot of times, the innovation is being pushed down to them and they're being asked to do this, and this was not always the case. So, I mean, number four, if you look at 30 years ago, where was the innovation done? Well, it was done at Bell Labs. You know, it was done at, you know, Palo Alto, you know, at, at Xerox Park. It was done at all these different places that these huge, huge labs, most of those are gone. You know, GE still has a massive facility. Uh, there are others that are out there, but most of that effort has been pushed down into the supply chain. And so in the automotive industry, Ford has said, and GM and Toyota is saying, they looked at their supply chain and they said, look, we're metal guys, you tell us how to make our car lighter. And so you got these small, medium-sized companies clamoring at the opportunity, and they got great ideas, but they don't have any tools. So how do I get this concept I have, this innovative idea I have, into a market, make it cost-effective, validate it for these large companies? They don't have the tools. Now, some of them are proactive, and they'd be out there trying to push the envelope. Uh, I think Addison talked about 8% under 400, after 100, under 100 people uh, you know, have those kind of tools, 92 do not. Uh, you know, it's just, it's a massive number of companies trying to innovate without technology. <clears throat> and so, whoops, hit the button too fast. So, these companies are being requested to look at more and more data, uh, and if they're equipped to handle it, they can. If they're not, they struggle. And so, I'm going to kind of jump ahead here. And we'll talk about, you know, the fact that there are two million of these companies worldwide. They don't have the tools. They're, be, they're trying to innovate. They're trying to be responsive. Platforms are getting more and more complex. Responsibilities are being piled up. And the responsibilities are being piled up with requests for cost reductions and faster response time. And so it's kind of a, it's, a, it's an opportunity, but it's a potential of a lose-lose as well for these companies that don't seem to have the ability to do that. I'm sorry, this thing's sensitive. So, 
what are the needs? What are the needs in the supply chain when we start talking about you know big data modeling and simulation, uh, digital manufacturing? Uh, you know, I'm going to start at the right. I'm going to bounce around here a little bit. But if you look at they, they need they need help, um, and some of them don't even know they need help. And so you'll see a lot of small manufacturers in the supply chain. They think they've got it covered, and they have no idea what they're in for. Others, you know, um, say, okay, I know I need help but I don't know how to access these tools, or if I do know how to access the tools, I can't find the expertise, which goes back to the STEM initiative that Intel is involved with, which is dead on. Um, and I think there was a, a Wall Street Journal report a few months ago, that there were 600,000 jobs unfilled in the United States. I mean, you know, all this unemployment, 8% unemployment, 600,000 jobs that they could not fill because there was not the talent pipeline to fill them. You know, you had all these people out of work, but none of them are qualified for the jobs that were there. How do you start lifting up people and getting young folks into these fields of interest? So instead of making video games, they're working on things that can have a larger impact within some of the manufacturing space. And it's, and it's a huge problem here in the United States. Uh, and so you've tried to find access to the hardware, access to the software, most especially it's access to the, to, to the, the expertise, the people. You know, and then they want to basically find tools that are um, that are simple to use, you know, to help with this ramp up of expertise, and they want to have some tools that are standardized to solve some of their basic problems. That doesn't solve all their problems, but they need to have some that can solve some of them. So, why do these companies not have these tools? Uh, you know, when we've talked about this, I, I really talk about different four different barriers for uh, the supply chain to have access to the tools. One is they need to be aware they exist. Um, if they become aware they exist, then they need to be able to have the perception that there's a value for them to invest in them. And once they do an investment, then it needs to be accessible, and that includes the expertise, and then they need to be able to, you know, implement them in their daily process. And so, but at NCMS, what we've been doing for the last three years is basically trying to create a mechanism to address those four challenges. And so we talk about four rungs in the ladder. We talk about educate, entice, engage, or elevate and engage. And, uh, and so you sit there and look at the educate. This is the awareness uh, for decision makers. It's the uh, understanding of the tools that are out there. It's some of the current and future workforce training mechanisms. Uh, the enticement is where we're trying to work with through funded programs and through our partners uh, to basically get them into a sandbox where it's subsidized, where they can kind of try and, and, and play without a huge upfront cost. And then we try to engage them in some real activities, solving real problems, elevate them onto their own two feet. And you know we call that our, our, our digital manufacturing initiative. Uh, we are in the process of setting up a, a series of centers. Uh, we have two going up this year. Our first one just launched in Michigan. I'm not going to go into that today. I'd be happy to talk about what those are. Many of you know what those are. Um, there. So again, I just talked about this a little bit. We're, we're putting up these cells, innovation cells, uh, and they'll be, they'll be specific around different types of activities. In Michigan, we're going to be talking about uh, advanced materials in Virginia, it's about transportation safety, uh, and there'll be some other smart manufacturing. I think it's one that we're targeting for the southeast, and there are some others under under consideration in different states and regions. The portal is basically the way to keep this all together. This UA data is actually a, a, per, a, a perfect vehicle for that. There's things in the United States that are pseudo similar. Uh, I don't think they have the scope of that. You know, I think of uh, Hub Zero and the Nano Hub thing through Purdue, that was uh, that was NSF funded. Um, there's also stuff on UCLA, uh, but there's just a lot of activities. But there's no, but there's no glue. And you know, I think NCMS we were created to kind of help be that glue when it comes to U.S. manufacturing. How do we pull some of these things together, and 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 make something cohesive? So this is my last slide. I just want to make sure it's really clear that there is a enormous opportunity out there with small, medium-sized manufacturers. Uh, you know, we, we tend to think, I'm not sure how many it is. I'll agree with Addison that, you know, where's our first bite at? Is all 300,000 of them end users? Probably not. Uh, I mean, almost for surely not. Uh, but, I mean, there are a lot of these companies that would benefit. And uh, I know we've had discussions about who would be those end users. And uh, if you have a manufacturing floor, you're pretty much designing your own tools. You may be not designing your parts, but you're designing your tools. And there are some simple software solutions that are out there, some packages that could really help these companies that, I mean, frankly, most of them don't even know are out there. And so with that, I'll end.
and uh, see if maybe we got ourselves back a little bit closer on track. Thank you. Yeah,